got a, a coaching call at 10 o'clock. So let's jump in and get going here. Um, so any takeaways from last week? Any ahas, anything you're going to implement from what we talked about last week? As we talked about the difference between having a listing presentation versus a listing conversation, right? Um, and so just to do a little bit of a, a quick review, um, we have, it's important to ask the pre-listing questions, right? And we gave you guys an example of one that you can implement if you don't have one. So we need to be the fact finder, right? We need to gather information about the home. Um, and then that helps us when we're running comps to know, uh, to know those things about the property. Uh, and then, we want to call to confirm the appointment, right? It makes us professionally attractive. And I think even sending if someone that you haven't met or even, even someone you have met, send a quick little video text, you know, put your face with the name um, and send that out to just to, to remind them. And if, if both parties or if they're more than one person making the decision, make sure both of them are or everyone is present because uh, it's hard to convey your message if one person's missing, right? Um, and then clearing your head, right? Get your head in the right spot uh, so that you visualize the outcome that you want, which is them to list their home with you. And so whether if that's a song or, you know, some rituals or, you know, we have mantra, the affirmations inside momentum that you could read uh, just to get your head in the right spot. And then, of course, arriving on time. We talked about that last week. That is super important to be professionally attractive to arrive on time, um, not necessarily early, but definitely not late. Uh, we convey a lot of different messages when we are late uh, to that potential seller. Is that you know, if I can't manage my own time, how am I going to manage your listing? Uh, and then removing your shoes or offering to remove your shoes again, just another thing that makes you professionally attractive and respectful of a seller's property. And then doing our conversation, having our conversation, uh, almost said presentation, our conversation at the kitchen table. Um, you know, if you think about a lot of life decisions and important things are done at the kitchen table, right? We sit down at the kitchen table. Uh, that's where, you know, if you if you have children or family, that's where you sit to eat. Well, unless you're like us, we sit at the on the couch. But <laughs> so, so but having those conversations at the dinner table uh, and then touring the home. Pay attention as you're going through, have your notes, right? And pay attention to things that they really geek out about because uh, those are features that are important to them that they feel like are selling points to the home. And so you want to make sure you highlight that stuff and you talk about it because if you don't, um, then you're not they, you're not paying attention to what's important to them. So make sure you do that. And as you're taking notes, I mean, that's a, that's a way to, to close. And especially if you involve them in it, like have the tape measure. And have them help you with taking measurements of the room. And so that, and if they, if they help with that, now you're engaging them in the process and that's getting their, their physical buy-in, right? So it's just a little way to, to help uh, with the ABCs. And then, um, you know, again, look for things too, you know, look for things that might be a challenge, like for FHA financing, if you see peeling paint or, you know, really outdated uh, flooring or something that might be an issue. If you don't know what those are, you can go on to the FHA website um, and find what those things might be for appraisal issues. And then have an agenda, right? Go through, tour the home, ask the right questions. And then when we get done with that, we come back to the kitchen table. Make sure you ask where they where they would like you to sit. Don't make the assumption um, of where to sit. And especially don't sit at the front, you know, the, the, the head of the table, if you will, because uh, you could potentially run the risk of offending. I shared with you guys last week that my mom had a, a special chair in the place I, I spent about my high school years. And, you know, she would get so irritated when my friends would sit in that chair when she would come home. And so um, I get that now as an adult. <laughs> I didn't understand it then. So just make sure that we're being respectful of that seller and that we aren't making the assumption of, you know, taking that seat or sitting at the head of the table. Does that now makes us the authoritative uh, figure in that um, situation? So that was just a little bit of a recap of what we talked about last week. Let's go ahead and jump in for this week. I think I don't have my slides in the right spot. Hold on a second here. There we go. Uh, so last week we talked about the, the conversation versus presentation. This week we're going to dive into what are the five stages of that conversation um, and being able to convert um, a potential seller into a listing. Um, you know, we talked about conversion rates a little bit and, you know, if, if we're only working our family and friends, our conversion rate's going to be really high. Uh, so I would challenge you to get out and talk to more people who don't know you, right, that, that are potential sellers. Um, we talked yesterday in the gas program about, you know, all of us kind of stepping up our game and using KB Core as a way to generate leads. And so, um, you know, every day we get, I get an email every day with 10 names of people that, you know, it tells me, call these people, you haven't talked to them in a while, call them. And so use, use that tool to our advantage to do some lead gen. 
Um, and just, I mean, I, I don't want to have this be an, an advertisement for KV Core, but, you know, the basic user is not getting what we're getting, what Remax has negotiated with them. So definitely lean into that because um, it, it is a tool that, you know, Remax sees the value for you, for all of us as agents. So let's use it. Uh, so pre-listing conversation activities. So again, we want to ask the questions, use that form. Um, we want to McDonaldize your business. And so asking the same questions um, and going deep with that and gathering the information. And now we want to talk about pricing. We have a pricing class that'll be coming up on, on the calendar. Uh, so I won't spend a lot of time on that, but becoming a pricing strategist is one way that you you put yourself in demand um, with sellers because sellers want to work with people who can get the job done, right? Hold it down. I'm not going to hold you. Uh, <laughs> call to confirm the appointment, uh, and then getting your getting your have your listing agreement prepared. Um, we can do that ahead of time, right? You can have a template already done. Uh, it used to be we'd actually like fill the stuff out. Well, nowadays don't necessarily want to do that with paper. Hold on a second. I got somebody trying to jump in here, and I can't get to her. Where is? Hold on. Might have to do a stop share there. No, I got it. Okay. Uh, so have that template ready to go, right? Uh, have it ready. And, and then that way, that's another way to close, right? It's, I, while I'm here, let's go ahead and fill out the paperwork and get your signatures. Uh, and then, of course, again, talking about getting on the right channel in your head and arriving on time. So this is the, the first step of the five stages. So we kind of already talked about a lot of this in the previous class. So step one, so, or I'm sorry, message one is setting the tone. So we want to create boundaries, right? And we talk a lot about this in momentum is having a win-win. It doesn't, it's not a, it, it's it, not a win for you to take an overpriced listing, right? It might seem like it, but it's really not because our job isn't just to amass a bunch of listings that never sell. There's a cost associated with that. And when they expire, you know, you don't get paid. Um, and it's also not a win for the seller either, because, you know, they, they, if they're in control of how they price it, now the home doesn't sell, they haven't taken responsibility for that. So we definitely want to set the boundary and there's some scripts and dialogues in here for you guys to uh, practice, to be able to accomplish that. And then message number two is our GPS, right? We want to have our goals, plans, and strategies. And so what are their, how do we help them uncover their needs um, and then prioritize those needs and then talk about the, the CMA or the pricing tools? Um, I had a, a great story of a guy a few years ago. Um, I had sold him a house and he was a big Dave Ramsey guy. And I'm sure, I, I assume all of you guys know who Dave Ramsey is. And so these guys were like hardcore and uh, sold him a house and then time came that they were going to move back to Utah. So got the house on the, you know, got to list the house for them. And in the beginning, you know, I priced it five grand over what the highest comps were. And he was super excited about that. Again, big Dave Ramsey guy, super excited about it. We, I said, you know, they had a little boy, a couple cats, a couple dogs. I said, we need new carpet and we need new paint. Why don't you get mom and the kids and the animals already relocated he had to stay here for, I don't know, 30 days or something to finish up work. And he was super excited. He's like, ah, I'm going to love this. I'm going to be able to sit in my underwear and play my video games and drink beer. And no one's going to nag at me. Right. And the first time he's going to be a quote unquote bachelor since he had gotten married. So we're super excited. And then five, five ish days in, he calls me and he's like, I, he's distraught. Like he's missing his family, like nobody's business. And he's like, I don't care about the five grand. I just need this house to sell. And so I ended up getting him the five grand. We, we did sell it uh, that weekend, but it, we went from being geeked out and excited and wanting that extra money and all these other things to seven days later being a completely different, in a different emotional state. And so we have to pay attention to those things because people will give us clues like that. And I love that story because it went from his priority was the money and now seven days later, the priority changed. And so we had to be mindful of that and paying attention to those clues. And so we'll help them prioritize those. And then again, talking about the pricing. And depending on who the person is, I may send comps ahead of time um, just because, you know, I want them to see the pictures and look at the stuff. Uh, but if it's somebody I don't know and I, I know they're interviewing other people, I'm probably not going to do that because uh, I don't want Steve coming in behind me and using my comps against me. Right. So because that's what I would do if you sent your comps out, I would totally use the comps against you. So I, I and, and everybody's got a different way to do it. Right. So whatever's comfortable for you. Um, again, if it's someone I know probably and I know it's a layup, I'm getting the listing uh, probably doesn't matter quite as much as it's someone that I don't know. Uh, so the next message three is getting the mutual agreement. Um, we're going to talk about the roles today. Um, what's the role, roles and expectations, just like we did in the buyer conversion class. And so having that mutual expectation, gaining that, getting that commitment, and then we close for the relation, close for the win-win. Uh, and lastly, the post-conversation activities are handling objections. Uh, and we have a whole class on objections. And then we want to answer concerns and questions that they might have. Um, and so 
a lot of times objections come because we haven't um, we haven't gone deep enough into understanding where they are, right? Where they are in the process. I think I shared this already, but one of the best listing appointments I went on with Nate, we never talked comps, never talked about marketing, never talked about commission. It literally was just, what are your goals and how can we help you get there? And at the end of the conversation, we walked to the door. She said, send me the listing agreement and tell me how to price it. It was beautiful, right? And that wasn't the only transaction we did with her. There was a couple others that we did as, and she was a sign call. And so um, really just a brilliant moment and, you know, just seeing her you know, share what her needs were. And so I think sometimes we get really in our heads about being brilliant and being the best and having this strong marketing and all this stuff and all that's great. But sometimes people, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And so that's the, what I love about this concept of having a conversation versus a presentation is that all of us can go sit down with someone and ask them that question. What are your goals and how can I help you get there? Okay. Uh, so handling the objections and, and then answering any questions. Um, I don't know if it's in the scripts class or not, but one of my favorite scripts to ask is that, you know, on a scale of one to 10, you know, how do I meet your expectations? Right. And so just going a little bit deeper um, and don't, don't assume the obvious, right. We, you know, <laughs> Nate's actually had this happen to him. A couple other agents I know have had it happen too, is uh, they lost a listing because they didn't tell the seller they were going to put it in the MLS. Just let that soak in for a second. <laughs> That's a dumb moment because of course we're going to put your house in the MLS, but this is every day at the office for us. It's not for them. And so, you know, the average person's in their home, you know, seven to 10 years. I don't know about you, but I don't really remember what I was doing seven to 10 years ago, not on a day-to-day -day basis. Right. And so we have to keep that in mind that, you know, we have to tell them all of those things. Um, I think we've talked about this before, but um, I have a document that the Russo team put together years ago, it's called 110 or 101, whatever it is, uh, things that we do when we list your home. If you want it, send me an email and I will send it to you. It's really brilliant. It goes through just everything down to making a key for the lockbox, right? Because there's a lot of stuff we do when we list a home, but we don't communicate that. And when we communicate it, now that defends our value. It defends the commission that we're charging them, right? When they see all of those things. Because, you know, a lot of people think that when, when they watch AGTV or HGT, whatever that is, I can't say it today. They watch that and they think that that's what, that's how we sell houses, right? Monica's on here. Monica, she was actually in a reality show years ago. It was about bank owned properties. She could tell you that all that crap that was on TV wasn't really how it was. We know that, right? So, but they don't know that. So it's our job to make sure we communicate that. Um Okay, so the, the, the pre-conversation activities. So the importance of this is that we want to differentiate yourself from the competition, right? Because if everybody thinks that we're all the same, um, if the consumers think that all realtors are the same, we have to differentiate ourselves from the competition. And each of you bring something unique from your past life that has nothing to do with real estate, but has everything to do with your character and who you attract into your business, okay? Uh, and then we want to add value to your, pro your have your value proposition, if, if, I, if I was in an elevator with you, what would be your elevator pitch to me, right? And so know what your value proposition is. We have the biggest and baddest tools, uh, being a REMAX agent plus the MLS, right? So lean into that stuff. You know, the balloon sells real estate. And so um, use use that tool, okay? And then increase your referral business um, just by doing, if we do a good job for someone, we should assume that they're going to want to refer us, right? We should, we should, we should, not, I shouldn't say assume, that's probably not the right word, but we should expect, right, that they would give us business if we did a good job and we asked, right? Uh, so the six pre-listing conversation activities, so getting the pre-listing questions filled out, having your pricing tools confirm the appointment, have your, your paperwork filled out, get your head in the right spot, and then arrive on time. Uh, at the bottom here, I don't know if I have it on my screen, I don't, um, this is on page 14. So real estate is not, is your rocket science. To build a large, healthy listing inventory, you must be intentional and proactive every step of the way. This requires that you study and practice and consistently improve both large and small components of your listing approach. Um, so I think I love that, right? And I say it all the time that this isn't rocket science, but I think we want to justify it, make it rocket science to, you know, because we're getting paid for it, right? Um, but it really doesn't have to be that complicated. Um, oh, I thought I already gave this to you guys. Okay, I guess not. Page 15. Here's the listing question, uh, listing questions. Um, so y'all could take this. If you want to, just copy it, right? Take it and implement it today. Don't overthink it and say, well, I want to add it or change it. Just start using it, right? You can white out the momentum stuff if you want to, or if you, if you wanted to put it on something else, I guess you could, but don't overthink it. This is better than not using anything, okay? Um, so that's my pitch for that. Use the tool. Uh, all right, so stage two. I'm not going to spend a lot of time going over this, these scripts because you guys can, um, you guys can read 
yourself uh, <laughs> inside the materials. So page 21. So uh, the win-win. So here's the script for the win-win, right? And then the bold part here is have a conversation to see if a win-win working relationship can be created. And so I think a lot of times we get into the space of being desperate, right? Like I need this listing. And so we're willing to sacrifice ourselves. And sometimes, you know, there's going to be a time when you don't want to take that listing. And not just because they're icky people, but if there are red flags, um, you know, we just a couple, what, two years ago, I think it was, we settled a lawsuit uh, with a with a team that was in our company and the buyer's agent. One conversation, if that conversation had been documented, the lawsuit would have never happened. Um, however, there were red flags all the way through this transaction. And Nate had even gotten involved at one point and said to the person, like, maybe this isn't the house for you guys to buy. And so, you know, it, sometimes there are things that are red flags, right? And so we want to pay attention to that because the worst thing you want to do is get sued. <laughs> Plus, and even that, worst thing, you know, you also don't want to work with someone who's just icky and sucks the life out of you. And so when we say the win-win relationship, this isn't saying I'm necessarily going to come take your listing, right? I could make sure we're going to be a good fit, that we're going to be good partners. Because if you take that listing and it, you got it for six months, that's a long time, right? It's a long time. And most of us, we're used to a listing being on the market six days, right? Or six hours. And so thinking about having a relationship with someone for six years, or six months, you know, that's a, that's different. What is your challenge today? Sorry, my little dog is whining at me. The agenda. So now uh, I have to uncover your needs, right? Then we have to agree on what's the most appropriate price point. And then we want to review the, the roles and expectations, which we're going to go over as well here in a couple okay. slides. Uh, so again, I'm not going to read the whole thing to you, but those the underlying bold parts are, are important for you to memorize and, and have that be a part of your internal dialogues. Uh, and then confidentiality. I love this. And so, um, you know, I've said this before, but if you ever, and Roberta can chime in, having been a lawyer, if you ever had a situation where you need someone to represent you as a lawyer, there's something very comfort, comfort, comforting knowing that I can tell this person anything and they have to take it to their grave, right? And so when we say this and have that confidentiality to say that, I want you, Scott, to feel comfortable telling me anything and it's going to stay here. I'm your trusted advisor, right? And then we want to move into the transitional phrase of let's see if we, if we can have a, a vision of a successful transaction. Okay, so same thing here. Go, the goals, G, or your GPS, so stage three, is before um, assembling the pricing and the strategy, you have to define the goal, right? So what is what is their goal? And so I'm asking that question on my intake, right? What do you think your home is worth? And I'm probably going to go on Zillow too, just because I don't want to be blindsided, even though I have every reason in the world to tell them why Zillow is not a tool to be used. Uh, but I, I need to know. Because that's the worst thing. If I get to if I get to an appointment and they know something I don't, it's going to throw me off my game, and and it's going to make me look like I don't know what I'm doing. And so I want to check all that out. Now, your high D personalities, when you ask the question, "What do you think your home is worth?" They're going to say, "Well, that's why I'm calling you, Kim." <laughs> okay, great. Now I know who I'm dealing with. Right? That's okay. I'm not going to get offended by that because that now they've told me who they are. And so I want to ask that question though, because most people are reasonable and are going to tell you that, or they're going to say, "Val, I need to get X dollars for you know whatever reason." OK, so we have to ask those questions and I want to know that information on the upfront. I'm also asking, how much do you owe? Um, because if those, you know, those numbers aren't in alignment, right, maybe they've only been in their house a year and there, there isn't enough equity. So I want to know that. And I want to know, do they have a second mortgage? OK, so there are some people out there that still have second mortgages. OK, uh, so I'm, again, I'm not going to read this to you, but on a scale of one to ten, What's what's the most desirable thing that would make the sale of your home a 10? And then you keep going until we've covered all of it. And I know it might seem like it's nauseating to keep asking the same question over and over, but we got to drill deep, right? We got to drill deep. Sometimes there's something there that we got to uncover. This always happens to me in coaching calls, be like the last 10 minutes and a coaching client is like finally getting to the meat of what we need to talk about. Right. And so that happens even with sellers in, in appointments. They're guarded. They're getting to know you. How much can I trust you? Right. And maybe there's something they're embarrassed about or something they don't they're uncomfortable. And so we have to drill deep. Right. And keep going until we get to the meat of what it is that they need. All right. So page 23, we're not going to role play. Um, so, again, uh, same kind of thing here is that on a scale of one to ten, keep going. So most most sellers are price and time. Those are usually the two hot buttons that they have. If they have a third, it's usually an expectation that they have of you as the realtor. And so, um, you know, and we got to know what that expectation is because if I don't know it, 
I'm not a mind reader. And so I don't know if you have this expectation. I can't fulfill that expectation. And then now I've failed to meet your expectation and make you a happy client that now I'm going to sell your house and you're going to move on and you're going to not like me, right? Or not refer me business or not do business with me in the future. And it's not that I did a bad job, but I there was something I didn't know that you needed. And so price, time, and then the, the third thing, you've got to know what it is. Um, so good price, right? We got to go deeper with that. Well, what is a good price? Why why is that a good price? Um, I had a client, um, she's my, my number one top 50 client. And uh, we just finished our eighth and ninth transaction together in 25 years. And at one of the transactions, she said, well, Sarah, I have to get a hundred grand to pay my grandma back. And there's no BS to true story. And I said, finally, the house just wasn't selling, right? Had a lot of issues. And uh, I said, I, I know your grandma and I, she's a very sweet lady, but unfortunately the market doesn't care. She doesn't care about grandma. And so we had to adjust our pricing and get realistic with that, right? But that that's a real story of someone with a real thing that needed a hundred grand to pay their grandma back and wanted to leverage, leverage their real estate. Unfortunately, it just wasn't there, right? Uh, and then quick sale. We got to qualify what's a quick sale. Well, if I need to be out in 60 days, does that mean out and done or under contract in 60 days? Because now we go back to the data and we look at the data and say, well, it might take me 60 days to sell your home. Uh, so if that's the case, right, now we need to evaluate how do I price it? And then are there conditions that need to be overcome, right? Because price price can overcome everything. It can overcome condition and location, right? Uh, and so... Um, Got to go deeper with that. Like, what does that mean to have a quick sale? Uh, and then again, what's the, is, is, there, is there another third thing that's on their mind? Like, maybe they want you to do an open house every single day. For some of you, that might be okay. Some of you might never want to sit in an open house, which you talk to me offline because I think that's not a good good plan for your business. But, uh, you know, and, and, and you know, a Nate probably doesn't want to sit open houses, but he's got a team to do it. Right. And so, um, but asking that question, they may not want an open house and you want to do an open house. So now we need to have that dialogue. Right. And so find out what that additional thing is that they need. Okay. Um, all right. So that's page 23. Uh, so the importance of uncovering needs, you must gain a thorough understanding of their needs. And so, um, if they say, is that really, do we really need to do this? Yeah, it's absolutely necessary, right? We have to go deep with that uh, to make sure that we can we can create a 10 plus plus experience for them. Um, and then down at the bottom, so the example, so we want a quick sale, we'll define what a quick sale is, okay? Uh, going three deep, some of you probably heard this, not a new, a new phrase, but going three deep. So tell me more about that. Tell me about the last time you sold a home. Well, if they're a first-time home seller, they don't have a previous experience, but maybe they were in the house when their parents sold and they had a short sale or a foreclosure, right? So ask those questions. You know, when, we, when we're in the process of doing anything, our reticular activator goes out and you know what that is, right? All of a sudden you start everybody and their brother crawls out of the woodwork, giving them advice. Um, I have a yellow Jeep. Up until the time I bought a yellow Jeep, never saw yellow Jeeps. Now I see them everywhere. Right. I thought I was cool having a yellow Jeep. Apparently there's a lot of them out there, but my reticular activator was not on. So I did not see the yellow Jeeps. And so the same thing here when someone's thinking about making a move. So we want to tell me more about that. Um, you know, tell me about your previous experience. And if they don't have a previous experience, somebody they know has. <laughs> OK. And so and maybe maybe they sold their home, you know, uh, when the market was really hot. And now that's their that's their bar is up here or their bar is way down here. Maybe they had a really horrible experience. And so they just need to listen and let them get that off their chest. And then now say, okay, we're going to do things different. Okay. So you guys have heard me say this too. My favorite script is just the word, oh, right? Because I can say, oh, in a lot of different ways to solicit different emotion and get people to, to share more with me. Um, so we got it. We can't, and we can't make assumptions. Um, I just, I took a class, uh, last, was it last week? I went to the spring training and I took a class on fair housing. It was called overcoming biases. And she used the example of a tattoo and how many of us have a bias around tattoos. And so, uh, so it was really interesting and just starting to think about my own biases that exist. And I like to think of myself as a pretty open-minded and, you know, living up to fair housing, but just simple stuff of having a bias about things. You know, we were out in our Jeep over the weekend and we were talking about people who ride side-by-sides. And so Jeepers, we get this attitude that people in side-by-sides are, you know, they just tear up the earth, and rah, right? That's a bias. And so we, we went, and, and also the biases they talked about, she gave the example of a couple and the, the, the realtor said, you don't want to buy in the city 
because when you have children, you're going to want to be in a good school district. So that was an assumption that this couple would want to have children and that making the assumption as their realtor that you don't want to buy there. Same thing. We got to be careful with like crime and schools and all those things. Right. So making sure why I'm going saying this is making sure that I don't go into that listing appointment, assuming what's in the best interest of the seller. And so it's making those assumptions or having those biases. So we got to ask the question and go deeper with it. What is, what is your vision of this, right? How can I help you get there? What's your goal and how can I help you get there? Okay. Um, and we always want to address their first priority. So if it's time or money, we want to always keep that in, in, you know, kind of like a pain, a pain point, right? So just keep coming back and sticking your finger in there and saying, but Steve, you told me that your number one priority was getting you moved in 60 days right? Or the price. And so whatever, or, or if it's the third thing that they're expecting from you. So you want to constantly go back to that because sometimes just like in the case of Jason, that priority changed, right? It changed after we were on the market, but the priority changed. And so we constantly want to go back to that. Okay. Um, to remind them that, you know, it, it, it helps with the communication. It helps the seller also really get clear on what is the priority. Okay, so some more scripts and dialogues for you guys here. Um, this is on page 27, so transition dialogue. So uh, again, I'm not gonna read all this stuff to you, but this just talks about how do I help them understand that if you need to be out of here in 60 days, it's price and exposure, right? Uh, and then if they were on the market and um, where is my next one here, sorry. Okay, this is the one I wanted. So if they were on the market as an expired, they were expired or canceled and you come on the scene, you want to ask these questions. So how did you arrive at your last price? Uh, how many showings did you have? Was there any feedback from those showings? And then why do you feel like the home didn't sell? And of course, they're going to most likely say, well, it was the realtor's fault, right? So your, your home was exposed to thousands of realtors in the MLS. Was the MLS information correct? Um, and so going back to how did you arrive at the price? And so this is where it's important when we go on listings and we take listings is that we allow the seller to take responsibility for how we price the house. And I think it's so easy for us to come in and be like, I'm the authority. I know about the comps. I know what we need to do. And that's fine. And yes, we do need to know about the comps. So we need to be a pricing strategist. But we also have to allow them to take responsibility and be a part of it. Because if we're doing a partnership and we're doing a win-win, they have to be a part of that. You do this long enough, you're going to take an overpriced listing. It's going to happen, right? It's going to happen. And so we have to be able to overcome that later on too. And how do I make those adjustments? Okay. And then feedback. Feedback is critical. Um, I've always had a, a, a rule in my business is that I don't want my client calling me first. If they call me first, then I feel like I have failed. Um, I've let them down. Even if I don't have anything to share or an update, that's going to be my update. Don't have anything to update you. Um, gosh, it's been six years ago. We sold my father-in-law's mobile home out in Wickenburg. And we were we were stuck using the mobile home realtor because it was one of those places where you had to use the, the on-site salespeople. And we only had 30 days to sell this property. And uh Every Friday, I was calling to ask for feedback and ask for a price reduction. And towards the end, they got annoyed with me, but they never once called us to tell us we had any showings. We never got one bit of feedback. It did end up selling, but we kept dropping the price every week. Um, and it was it reaffirmed for me this core value I've had in my practice of making sure I call people before they call me, right? It really reaffirmed that because we were in the dark. We had nothing. We didn't know, right? And we just lost him. Like it was a whole thing, right? And so actually he was still, he was on hospice. And so we had all these other things we were dealing with. The last thing we needed to deal with was whether or not this mobile home was selling, okay? And so making sure we get feedback. And the same thing, if you're asked for feedback, give feedback. And don't just give feedback to go through the motions. Like give real feedback, if it smells like animals, then give the feedback in a polite, professional way, uh, but give tangible feedback. If something, if it's overpriced, by how much? Or why is it overpriced? You know, it, it is the location or there's some, you know, something issue with the floor plan, like give feedback that now the seller can work with, right? Some, I mean, obviously can't necessarily change a floor plan, but if it's got popcorn ceiling and that's the feedback from the client that they don't like it, give that feedback. Seller can change that, right? And also, if, if that's your buyer's objection, then we can work with that too. So <laughs> I wouldn't lose a deal over popcorn ceiling if, if it was the right house, okay? 
So make sure we're given that information. Okay, so the next one is another justification statement. It's about pricing. And again, we're going to get into a whole pricing class and go over these scripts and dialogues. Um, but I do love this here that says, leaving your money on the table is simply unacceptable. And we can say something like that because how many, I mean, we have a reputation, right? We have a reputation that we just want to get rich and, and make commission. Uh, and then we want to sell things fast. And we don't care about the seller's bottom line. And so making sure... Um, that if you say that, if I say to you, it's unacceptable for us to leave your money on the table, now that changes the dynamic of our relationship, right? It doesn't, it takes me out of that category of just wanting to get paid fast into now being your, your, your consultant, right? Your partner, someone who's looking out for your best interest. And so that should always be the vibe that we're putting off is that I'm looking out for your best interest. Um, all right, so page 28. So again, CMA. Um, <laughs> the, the top here says don't overwhelm them with a 40 page CMA, which ma makes me laugh because if you're using RPR or toolkit or even the new stuff that we've got from KB Core, they're big old presentations, right? <laughs> with the data. So whatever works for you in the pricing class, it's really stripped down. Um, it just basically talks about having three comps of active sold. Uh, pending and expired. Okay. So uh, it, whatever works for you, whatever's your jam on that and what makes you comfortable, use that. Okay. So if you're using something now that, that you're comfortable with, use it. Okay. Uh, so I'm not going to get into this. We'll talk more about pricing and pricing class. Um, all right. So the agreement. So looking at the sold information available, can you understand how re a reasonable buyer would price your home somewhere between? And we want to identify if there's a range, you know, high, uh, high, middle and low. And usually there is, especially if you're, if you're doing stuff in master plan communities. Uh, and that being said, if, if you're going on an appointment, like you know, living up here, not everything's master plan. And even in the, the neighborhood I live in, I don't think there's one house that's the same. <laughs> everybody's all custom homes up here. And so uh, it wasn't like this was built by one particular builder. And so don't be afraid to go out, tour the home, gather the information you need, and then do a secondary appointment uh, to now talk about price, right? Because uh, And same thing if it's highly upgraded, you know, all that, if, if, if running just basic MLS stuff is not enough, don't be afraid to do that. Another thing too, don't be afraid of is an appraisal. If you guys like each other, but we can't get, a, get on, on the same page with price, Offer to do an appraisal, have them pay for it. You'll reimburse them at closing um, or not. That's up to you. Uh, and then now if we get a third party that, that, that we have that opinion, now we still like each other. Third party comes in and says the house is worth X. And if you price it slightly below that, now that's a marketing tool, price below appraisal. Right. And, in a, in a, and a, that could be a dollar. Right? It doesn't matter uh, as long as it's priced below. But that now gives the consumer the feeling like, oh, this is a good deal. Right. Um, and so that's another another option that you have that, you know, right now in this market with with stuff sitting a little bit longer. Although I'm hearing some stories of properties getting multiple offers and lots of showings. So who knows what's really going on out there. Um, but, you know, if, it, if it's got condition issues, things like that, it's not a bad idea to do the appraisal route. Um, okay, so seller's remorse. I think this happens when a house sells too fast, um, not necessarily in the last few years of the market, but in a more traditional market, if something sells quickly, uh, you know, especially when if, if the average time on market used to be 64 days, um, if a home sold quickly, now that seller's perception is that we didn't price it right. We priced it too low. And so I love this because it basically says that it may I ask you why you would feel that way. Let the dialogue happen. And then is your goal to get your needs met within your designated time frame? We've got to move in 60 days, right? Would you agree that pricing your home at the appropriate price entry point increases the odds of getting one or more offers on your home in that designated time frame? And then would you feel your needs were any less satisfied if the offer came in on the first day or the 60th day? Right. So we have to, we have to, we have to overcome that. Um, there's a, a statistic, and it's not in any of the scripts, but there's a, a statistic that NAR says that uh, for every 10 showings, you should get an offer. So if we've gotten 12, 15, 20 showings, we haven't got an offer, then we're off on price. Uh, but if we, if we, you know, we get an offer within that time frame, and you guys, if the average time really was 60 days, nobody wants their house on the market for 60 days, right? They really don't, you know, because it's a pain in the butt, especially if you've got kids or pets, you got to have your house show ready at every moment of the day. Um, it's a pain, right? And if they say I'm not in a hurry, that's the biggest lie that ever comes out of anyone's mouth uh, when they're in the process of buying or selling a home. And so, because the minute that yard sign goes up, they become in a hurry, okay? Uh, so we just want to make sure we address that and helping them understand that, you know, 
new homes come on the market into the MLS and there are buyers out there that are looking. And so when we want to get you know, the, the right buyer to see your house at the right price, right? Um, and so we wanna make sure we cover that. Uh, and that's the second part of the script in page 30 is that if someone who's ready and willing to pay X dollars for your home, they see it on the first day on the market, shouldn't we expect an offer, All right? Um, so we do, but I think it's important we address that up front because the last thing that you want is for that client to walk away and feel like you underpriced their home, okay, or that they left money on the table, okay. Um, I want to jump ahead here just to in lieu of time, and you guys have these scripts. So, uh, page 32. So, the roles. So, just like the buyer conversion class, we have the same thing here. So, what you can expect from me as your listing consultant. And this isn't a be all end all. This is to me a base that you guys can start with um, and add to it because I know that there's more than 15 things that we do uh, when we represent a seller, but it's definitely a good start. And you'll see that a lot of these have to do with our fiduciary duties. All right. And a lot of us aren't talking about that and talking about what are the fiduciary duties. We get the agency signed, but do we really spend time talking about what it is to be a fiduciary? All right. So it's a really important tool that we have. I think you could almost build an entire conversation for both buyers and sellers just talking about the fiduciary duties that we are obligated to provide. Right. Uh, and so, again, I don't think that I think this is just a start. The roles, um, just like the buyer conversion, I would add a signature line to this for both myself and the client. Anytime we sign, some, sign something, it changes the, the commitment to that. And then marketing and promotion. So once your home's listed, again, I think there's more than seven things that we do, um, especially with, you know, all the, these materials were written a long time ago. So now we have a lot of, you know, online, social media, things like that. If, you know, are you going to do open houses or not? Um, you know, again, working with the seller to see if that's in their best interest which it is, but some sellers don't want to have open houses and that's okay. Uh, so door knocking, you know, making sure we're canvassing the areas. And again, I think we're doing more than seven things. And if you guys want that tool from Russo, send me an email and I will uh, get that to you. Uh, but make sure, put it in the MLS, right? It's number two, <laughs> number two on there. Uh, but what about lockbox, right? Lockbox should be on here. Why is a lockbox important? Some agents won't even show a house if it doesn't have a lockbox. Right. And what's the put what could be the pushback? Well, I have animals or I have kids or whatever. So now we got to address that conversation and figure out how do we navigate that so that they feel comfortable. Okay. So that they feel comfortable with the showing process. Okay. Um okay. So yeah, again, add to this and then whatever you're doing, I would put a, a signature line on it. So that is that. Uh again, just like the buyer one. Your competition isn't using this tool, you guys. And so I think it's really important that that we have this because if, if the consumer thinks all of us are the same, we have to differentiate ourselves from the competition and this is one way to do it, okay? So if you take anything from this, I hope it's that. Um, all right, so agreeing on the marketing plan. How am I doing on time here? Okay, uh, agreeing on the marketing plan. So it's important to gain the agreement every step of the way. ABC, right? Everybody knows what ABC stands for, always be closing. And so when we ask questions that require a yes answer or a no answer, we're gaining that, we're gaining that commitment, right? And so we want to make sure that we that we shut up and let them answer yes or no. And if it's no, then go a little bit deeper with it, right? Find out why. Um, so after that, so is there anything on this plan that concerns you or that you would like to change? Okay. Um, or add. Right. And so now that again, that's another question that we can go deeper with this and find out, am I meeting your expectations? Is there a third thing that, that you want me to do uh, that I don't know about? Um, and then once you've agreed on that, we want to focus on uh, the role as the cooperating seller. OK, so what do we have to expect of them? Right. So same thing with the buyers is what do we expect of them? And this is on page 34. So, you know. I, th I think this is a pretty good list. If there's anything else you want to add to it, you certainly could. Um, but you know, this tool, again, we go back to them taking responsibility and being your partner in the process. This document helps to do that, right? To let them know uh, what are the things that they need to be doing. And if they're a first time seller, they may not know all this stuff. Um, I had a, a past client of mine and I've helped her buy and sell a couple houses. And this last one, she left the house bad, tra like trash, like cat, dirty cat box. Like it was, it was bad. I mean, she paid someone to take care of it, but it still was pretty uh, shocking. And I thought about it and I was like, I just swore that we talked about this, right? But somewhere I dropped the ball 
and, and communicating with her about how she needed to leave the home, the condition she needed to leave it in. It worked out okay. Cause like I said, she paid someone to do it, but it was still pretty shocking to, to come there the day she left and see all this stuff. And so, um, so just making sure that we're really you know, go over the stuff and that they understand what it is that they need to do in order to have their home look good um, and, and be ready for showings. And, you know, cleanliness is subjective, right? It is. Some people, you know, Friday night is, is pulling the beds out and vacuuming behind them, right? That's what they do on a Friday night. Uh, some people never vacuum under the beds until they move. And so cleanliness is subjective. And so we want to make sure um, one of our agents, she actually pays for every property that she either uh, helps a buyer or a seller. She pays for it to be pro professionally cleaned. It's just part of her package that she offers. And, you know, she, she says that there's nothing better than, you know, as a buyer coming into a home that's been cleaned. And as a seller, it's just a huge value add, right? That they don't have to worry about that as they're rushing to, to get out of the home. So um, just something, another, another way that you can stand out from your competition. Uh, so the next thing is verifying the value. So making sure that um, you've defined the roles. Okay, do you think they're fair? Is there anything else that should be considered? And then do you see value in what I do? Um, or do you see more value from your previous agent than, or see more value in me than your previous agent if this is an expired listing? Okay. Um, all right, so page 36. So this is the close. If the seller has been allowed to self-discover what a working relationship with you would be like, and you've established yourself as a valid professional, closing should be a snap. Okay, so uh, again, you guys can go through your scripts, but the main question here is after our conversation tonight, I feel we have the making of a win-win relationship. Do you agree? Okay, and so and again, as you read through these, you're going to notice that a lot of the things that are stated require them to have a, a, a yes or no answer. Okay. Um, and then it also says in here that I would love to list with you, but I've set an appointment with another realtor. And so the script is, would you like me to call that other agent and cancel the appointment? And let them know you'll be listing your home with me. And I've been on the receiving end and the giving end of that phone call. <laughs> And so it takes the pressure off of them. People don't want to be rude, right? They don't be rude. They've already made the appointment with you. And so they, you know, they, they want to, they want to uh, proceed with that, but give them the option, right? Make, you can be the bad guy, not them, right? Take that pressure off of them. Um, I've actually had that happen with the referral I sent to somebody in Georgia and the agent just wasn't doing a good job. And so I told them, I said, I'll call and, and, and sever the relationship for you. So they weren't listed. It was just a referral that, the the sale had the, the agreement hadn't been made yet and they were dropping the ball so uh because i don't think i could actually cancel the listing if it was listed so <laughs> make sure i'm clear there <laughs> so uh call the other agent make the offer right to, to cancel that appointment and then lastly here just kind of a recap so the basic listing conversation process so again ask get the pre-listing questions you guys now have a tool that you can implement into your business um talking about the pricing we have a whole class. We're going to go over that, uh, getting into the pricing. Um, and, you know, take a listing in your area and, you know, value your new. Take a listing in your neighborhood. Run some comps, practice, look at it, and then st study it. And when it sells, see how good you were, right? Um, we can all do that. I have myself set up on, a, on an MLS search for my neighborhood. So when things get listed or sold, I get an alert. I want to know what's going on. And then call to confirm the appointment. Again, use your use your video if, if you haven't met them or even if you have, you know who they are. It's just a nice, nice way to uh, change up your, your, your communication. And then prepare the listing agreement. We all have templates inside of, hopefully you're all using the Sky Slopes, uh, Sky Slope. And then getting on the listing channel, whatever that looks like for you, right? Whatever, whatever mantras or music or whatever you need to do to get your head in the right spot. And then we want to arrive on time, offer to remove your shoes, move towards the kitchen, request a tour of the home, right? Make sure you're taking notes uh, and building rapport, you know, look for ways to connect. You know, if you see that they, a, a picture of them in Hawaii on the black beach and you've been there, pause for a minute and talk about your experience of being there, right? Find a way to connect with them. If you, if you golf and you see that they've golf golf stuff around, that's a way to connect, right? Uh, so build rapport, use the Ford family occupation, recreation dreams. And then lastly, come back and ask where to be seated. We want to tee it up for the win-win, review your agenda, offer the confidentiality. Uh, if, you're, if your car is branded in any way, make sure you ask uh, or let them know that and ask where you should park. 
because maybe they don't want the neighbors to know or their children to know or whoever, right? So if you've got realtor as your license plate or some kind of a, 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 a you know, something on your car that's evident that you're a realtor, make sure you ask, okay? Um, help them to uncover their needs and then prioritize those. Then we're going to talk about the, 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 the pricing um, and getting into that, reviewing that data with them. And then what's the most appropriate price point that we want to enter? And, you know, again, if there's a trend there, uh, depending on where I would suggest that they price them, you know, I might run some cost sheets uh, to say, here's the low end, the middle end, and the top end, right? And it's really cool when you do that and they pick the middle price that you, is where you really want them to price it. It feels so great when that happens because you've led them down the path and then they pick the price that you, that you think is the right price. Uh, and then we want to verify that that meets their needs, whether that's, you know, paying off their loan or, you know, what are their future goals? We want to eliminate any remorse that they might have and then transition into the roles and expectations, marketing, all of that, and then close, right? Close for the, the value and close for the listing agreement. So um, if I were you, I'd probably print this out and just have this, you know, available so that as I'm going on listing appointments or, building out my listing plan, I've got this so I can uh, make sure I include all of these bullet points in what I'm doing, okay? And the last things in your guys' materials, uh, page 39 and on to what, 41, uh, some listing tool, uh, listing conversation tools, uh, your package that you need to have if you're going to take a paper package, which I think most of us probably aren't doing that anymore, and then uh, a letter to let them know what's going to happen next. If you're using a TC, they probably have something similar to this. And so I would get with, with them and make sure that there's some kind of letter going out because, you know, they're not going to remember everything you talked about the night of or the day of the appointment. And so re reinforcing that with something that goes out. I don't know if KB Core is going to have something like that, maybe. Uh, but, you know, you could also take this and do it as a video. Right, we could have all of the processes that we do as uh, throughout the seller or throughout the listing could be turned into a video, and now that's evergreen content that's recorded and set, and that it's just done, right? And it's stored, and every time you get an appointment or get a listing, it fires off. Okay, and then there's some samples of thank you notes for you guys uh, if you don't know what to say on a thank you note. There's some examples. So questions, comments, thoughts. Scott went into witness protection. So, Roberta, you're going to come off mute. Sorry, I had a little thing to deal with with the client. No worries, no worries. Well, I like hearing you have a client. That's exciting. Uh, we just got a Binzer um, back that they're going to do the 9,000 items that the client wanted them to do, which was ridiculous, but it works. So, it's all good. <laughs> Who are you representing? The buyer. You are. <laughs> Very Love. Typical buyer, low ball offers got booted by the seller, you know, all kinds of fun. It's been very interesting. So, well, you know, Scott, that's how it rolls when you're new. So you always get all those crazy ones and get them out of the way. And, you know, the first few transactions teaches you the most. So <laughs> yeah. no, it's all been good. So <laughs> good, good. I always say, you know, you can come to class and hear me lecture and talk theory and all this stuff, but there's no better training than boots on the ground. Yeah. All right. So um, anybody else, any questions, comments, thoughts? Kim shaking her head. No, I think all of you are signed up for Friday, right? You're all coming on Friday. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. So just come prepared, uh, come hydrated because the girl will be shot out of a cannon. So um, has anybody actually seen him in person besides Roberta? You have Steve. Okay. Okay. And maybe Tanya too. Um, what did he, where did you see him? Oh, you've gone to leverage. That's right. You're right. That's where you've seen him. Yeah. Okay. Well, you guys are in for a treat, so it's going to be really good. Um, so bring a notebook cause you'll be taking notes and, uh, like I said, come hydrated. So it's going to be a fast paced three hours of time. So uh, but I look forward to seeing you guys there. If you need anything, reach out. Um, I don't know what we have on the agenda next week. So uh, we do have some KB core classes coming next week on Wednesday. Alex is going to be in person at Arrowhead North. Uh, look at the times because we have it set for beginner, intermediate, and advanced. Okay, so wherever you feel like you are in that, uh, you can go look on the Facebook or the Google Google calendar and see what items he's going to cover in each of those. Um, so, I mean, obviously, if you wanted to go to all three, you could, uh, but just know that he's trying to tape, kind of tailor that to meet you where you are in your learning curve of KV Core. Okay. And then we've got uh, an investor thing on Thursday uh, that Richard Cook and Tina Powers are putting together. Uh, so on helping us basically build wealth through real estate. So that's uh, also on the calendar for next week. So um, if you guys need anything, reach out. Otherwise have a fabulous day, stay healthy and safe, and I will see you all on Friday.
Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. You're welcome. Take care. Bye-bye.